Hey, it's your old pal Lucid Stew again. We are continuing to move through the Federal Railroad Administration high-speed rail corridors. In this video, we're going to look at the Empire Corridor. The Empire Corridor is located completely in New York State. New York is the largest state in the American Northeast, both by area and population. New York City is the largest city in New York and the United States. New York State's population is about 20 million, and in a strange twist, the population of the New York City Metro is about the same because it spans four states. New York State hosts five other metro areas with more than 500,000 people, including three with more than one million, Albany, Rochester, and Buffalo. All five are in the Empire Corridor. As a result, this corridor links the vast majority of the population of the state. The southern terminus of the Empire Corridor is Penn Station in Manhattan, New York City. The corridor works its way up the Hudson River Valley to Albany. It then takes a left turn up the Mohawk River Valley until it emerges into the Lake Ontario Lowlands. After winding through the Buffalo area, it ends at the Canadian border near Niagara Falls, about 85 miles from Toronto. Let's take a look at some of the potential benefits of high-speed rail in the Empire Corridor. Number one, it connects most of New York State with a viable third form of transportation. New York City is the king of mass transit in the United States, but New York State's regional rail outside of the Northeast Corridor leaves something to be desired. A high-speed train in the Empire Corridor could improve that. Number two, it takes pressure off of New York City airports. About one-fourth of upstate New York commercial flights travel between there and New York City. High-speed rail could reduce that load. There is also potential to connect Manhattan to New York Stewart International in Newburgh via high-speed rail in about 40 minutes. That would peel some flights off JFK, LaGuardia, and Newark and delay expensive expansions there. Number three, potential connection to Toronto. This would benefit upstate New York greatly by bookending the corridor with the largest metro in Canada. Number four, it further opens the state to tourism. From Niagara Falls to leaf peeping to New York City, a tourist could fly into any major New York State airport and have the ability to access the state by rail at a convenient travel speed. But it's not all roses. Let's look at some of the challenges this idea presents. Number one, getting out of New York City at speed is a major ask. Once you do get out, the Metropolitan Transportation Authority owns a good stretch of the tracks and is currently using them for third rail service. If MTA isn't on board, you have a real problem on your hands. Number two, the Hudson River Valley and Hudson Highlands present a major engineering puzzle in terms of getting through both at anything over 100 miles per hour. Number three, the Hudson River. It must be crossed. Where and how will have a big impact on cost and overall speed. Number four, the Mohawk River Valley. This is a winding narrow river valley that leads between Albany and Syracuse. It makes straight track near impossible and would be difficult to circumvent entirely. Number five, the Buffalo-Niagara area, a tangle of oddly routed rail, unavailable decommissioned rail rights of way, narrow, poorly routed freeways, and single family housing up the yin-yang in the worst places possible if you want to run new rail through there. High-speed rail is usually considered to have a high speed of 150 miles per hour or more. However, the Federal Railroad Administration is generally aiming for a top speed of 110 miles per hour in service on these routes with Siemens chargers like this one. Before we look at true high-speed rail, the question must be asked, can we even get to 110 miles per hour as the FRA would like? The way we test this is by looking at some curves on the existing route. For the purposes of this investigation, a 110 mile per hour curve with a tilting train set will have a minimum radius of 4,000 feet. The answer then is yes, on a mostly 110 mile per hour route. That however is quite different from a system capable of averaging 150 miles per hour, which often requires curves with radii of two miles or more. Let's quickly review our high speed rail principles and then dive right in. Within this corridor, I see two possible alternatives. The first would follow the existing route as much as possible and straighten out curves even further. 
The second would get across the Hudson as soon as possible to avoid the slower parts of the Hudson River Valley, thereby giving us a better average speed. As mentioned, the New York City terminus of the Empire Corridor is Penn Station. The Empire track out of Penn is tunneled under the tracks coming in from New Jersey on the NEC through the north side tunnels. They only link up at the platform. This means NEC to Empire is a two-seat ride to points west without alteration to Penn Station. Continuing east toward Boston would be possible if the Empire Corridor were electrified. From Penn Station, the corridor moves in a northerly direction on the west side of Manhattan. This is an old rail cut freight route that is mostly covered, but portions still see the sun in Manhattan. This portion is now owned by Amtrak. It emerges from darkness on the northern end of Riverside Park. Some curves keep this section under 90 miles per hour, but that's okay in our urban part. It does need to be electrified and better sealed. Our first engineering challenge is at the Harlem River. Currently, the line is single-tracked across a swing bridge. We want double-track and no movable bridges. Required navigational clearance is 100 feet, so it's up and over we go. This structure would need to be about a mile and a half long at a reasonable grade. On the other side of that bridge, the right-of-way is owned by MTA, and that track is third rail. MTA would either need to agree to switch to an overhead catenary system or our high speed line would need to use dual mode trains at lower speed on third rail portions. That is perfectly okay in this case because the right of way constrains speed to 90 miles per hour in this portion anyway, and it would be near impossible to improve that without massive lengths of tunnels. Our first chance of crossing the Hudson on this stretch is at the Mario Cuomo Bridge, but I'll come back to that later. In the Montrose area, you have a couple of slow speed curves that can really only be resolved with a tunnel. A few miles further at peak skill is the worst of it at the southern end of the Hudson Highlands. This curve is sub 60 miles per hour and nearly unimprovable without a huge curved bridge over the river that no one would go for. As a result, on your high speed line, you're probably going to be below 60 miles per hour for at least 5 miles here. The Hudson Highlands are where the Hudson River cuts a jagged path through a 12 mile wide line of hills and small mountains. This is insurmountable unless sticking to the current rather slow right of way or digging a roughly 15 mile long tunnel. The MTA owned tracks continue north to Poughkeepsie. After that, the right of way is owned by CSX but operated and maintained by Amtrak. From there to Albany, the track is straighter and more conducive to high speed. This looks doable, so the main thing is curves. Let's take a look at some with a 2 mile radius objective. 200 miles per hour probably not happening, but 150 looks possible in stretches with some exceptions. Conclusion, faster than 110 the whole way is doable with some investment. The current route crosses the river at Albany on this lift bridge we don't want. We're in town, so our goal is to stay at 90 to 110 miles per hour. What gets demolished depends on the exact routing and speed. This highlighted route is about speed. The current station for this area is on the other side of the river from Albany at the edge of the metro area. A high-speed train could continue to stop there, too. I like a location more central to the area across I-90 from U Albany, about four miles from downtown. This is also near state government offices and some redevelopment potential. From there, we continue along the Interstate 90 right-of-way at high speed. In New York, I-90 is a toll road controlled by the New York State Thruway Authority. Anything taking place in the I-90 right-of-way would need to be approved by this body. However, since this high-speed rail line would be constructed solely in New York State, one assumes this wouldn't be an issue. At a town named Fultonville, both freight and interstate begin following the Mohawk River more closely. This route is untenable without completely ruining the character of the river valley. Instead, I've opted for a third type of right-of-way, power. We want to avoid cutting large new swaths of rail right-of-way. However, if we need to, a good place is along power transmission lines. This gives us an already cut path and should make land acquisition easier. These paths are generally straight 
and an added bonus, our train is electric. That will take us about 100 miles where we can reconnect to Interstate 90 a little past Utica. Once to Syracuse, I like a 150 acre piece of property between I-90 and Syracuse Hancock International Airport for a station there. This heavily forested area could be carefully developed for mixed use. You could also connect the station here to the airport by a mile and a half of tunnel. Syracuse starts a trend that exists from here on out. It's difficult to get to the city center in a way that makes sense with high-speed rail. Here you need to go out of the way on some weird ring road, unless you want to try to deal with this, and it's slow anyway. By the way, this is by far the simplest of the three. 80 miles further east, I'm electing to somewhat bypass Rochester due to the aforementioned difficulty. The junction of Interstates 90 and 390 is a good location. Lots of land to develop. I have a stop in Buffalo at Buffalo Niagara International Airport on a 10 mile long spur. This would originate from the juncture of Interstate 90 and a power transmission line path that heads to Niagara Falls. This right of way effectively circumvents Buffalo's suburbs and this is the only way to both serve Buffalo and reach the Canadian border at high speed without massive destruction. Buffalo has considered expanding its light rail system from downtown to the airport, so it's a good potential fit. Another option is the old Buffalo Central Terminal six miles closer to downtown. Offers a lot of redevelopment potential, but the routing is extremely tricky due to the terminal being abandoned about 40 years ago. For Niagara Falls and the Canadian border, we will once again need to follow power transmission routing the suburbs of Buffalo combined with various nature preserves in the area make any other option quite dubious. The Toronto option would extend this 85 miles to Union Station, Toronto. I'll let the Canadian government worry about cost and routing. This does bring up the issue of the border and customs. We've talked about connecting to Toronto in two videos now from New York and Michigan. Our governments should be creating cross-border agreements and protocols to eliminate border crew changes and customs checks. Customs and immigration should be handled at the terminal, just like an airport, not at the border. Otherwise, the concept is moot. Final cost on this route from New York City to the Canadian border is $54.8 billion. Here are some estimated travel times. New York City to Niagara Falls, 3 hours 35 minutes. New York City to Albany, an hour and 25 minutes. Albany to Rochester, an hour and 35 minutes. Syracuse to Buffalo, 50 minutes. I did look at an alternative route crossing the Hudson at the Mario Cuomo Bridge and going up Interstate 87 before continuing from Albany as previously described. This route is a little cheaper and a little faster. It does hook up with New York Stewart International Airport, but the Hudson River route has a tourist draw that more than makes up for it, so I won't go into further detail on the I-87 alternate route. The Empire Corridor from New York City to Albany is one of Amtrak's busiest routes. It takes two and a half hours to traverse the roughly 150 miles. High-speed rail could cut that in half but at a cost of $23 billion. Passenger rail traffic drops by 60% west of Albany, with those metro cores being oddly impenetrable to high-speed rail, would it be worth $27 billion more? We can build high-speed rail to the Canadian border, but with nothing equivalent on the other side, what's the point? It is possible for this corridor to connect to other FRA high-speed rail corridors, Buffalo to Cleveland would connect with a hypothetically built-out Chicago hub network, affording a six-hour Chicago to New York trip. However, the possibility of a similar connection exists through Pennsylvania on a designated high-speed rail corridor. The Empire Corridor could connect to the NEC eastward at Penn Station in Manhattan, but the Northern New England Corridor proposes to connect to Albany in a way that would be mostly more efficient for the Empire Corridor as well. The decision is mainly up to the people of New York since the Empire Corridor lies completely in their state, but I think this is one route better left at 110 miles per hour considering the potential cost and potential benefit of trying to reach 186 miles per hour or higher. 
more Federal Railroad Administration High Speed Rail Corridor videos to come. The next video in this series will cover the now defunct Florida Corridor of which Brightline currently utilizes a portion. Look for that in three or four weeks time. Stu's News is due next week so check that out for all the high speed rail news worth consuming in the last month. But that's all for now. Until next time, I'll see you on that big beautiful freeway. Mm -hmm.